I really want to thank you all for uh, welcoming me home. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, I sit here, and it's, it's kind of a bittersweet feeling I have. Um, my mom's in the audience, and I know that she probably has listened to more conversations uh, in Charlottesville than anyone will ever have, because she used to work on, remember those old uh, switchboards? Oh, yeah. She used to pull out oh, of my goodness. Right? She used yeah. to work on those, and uh, it, it was my dad that gave me, uh, he kind of set the example for me. He was, he was kind of someone I looked up to uh, as he served on the UVA Police Department here when I was growing up. So I'm here, I'm home, uh, because when I left home, I joined the Army. And one of the core Army values is duty. I feel that sense of duty still. I have that sense of duty to my country, to help it heal, and to this community uh, that took care of me as I was growing up. So my first question is going to be, as you introduce yourselves, because I'm a big fan of Stephen Covey, and he says that we should start with first things first, right, and begin with the end in mind. So first things first, um, if you want to just give a brief something about why today, why here, why now, and then let's start with the end in mind. What's your perfect picture of what Charlottesville should look like after we've all come together and done the right thing to heal? What does that look like? Can I start with the ladies? Oh, sure. Outstanding. Um, thank you. So um, why are we here? I think it's, uh, there's, it reflects a, a crying need for uh, solutions to some chronic problems. Uh, problems of, of uh, entrenched poverty, particularly among um, our minority communities or uh, low wealth African American communities. Uh, there's uh, entrenched problems related to just how we function as a city. Um, do we have the right kind of road infrastructure? Do we have the right kind of housing? We're becoming a victim of our own success because of the um, desire of people to live in cities. More and more people are coming to live in places like Charlottesville, and it's r raising the value of our land, and it's raising the cost of housing. I think the cost of housing, uh, the lack of affordable housing, is, 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 is really exacerbated the long-standing uh, issues of, of race and poverty that this city has had since Jim Crow and before. So I, when I say the, the era of, of segregation. So why now? I think the, um, the, uh, the assault, I call it, that happened uh, on August 12th, 2017, that brought to this small community, uh, we're not even quite 50,000 people, uh, so many people filled with hate, uh, hate against African Americans, hate against Jews, hate against Muslims, hate against immigrants, hate against women who were a little bit too out there with their own careers and ambitions. I think that, that, that the, the, when they descended en masse on this city, I think it really um, was both a wake-up call to us that, wow, there really is an undercurrent in the country that's been unleashed. Um, and two, maybe this, is, maybe this is our time to really solve those chronic problems because there's enough desire and energy and passion to do that right now because we don't want to be defined by August 12th, 2017. So that's why I think now is important. We're four months away from the anniversary date of that day. A lot of us have been working very hard to make it a very new day and that will be stronger and better, more equitable, more sustainable, more viable, more beautiful by the next August 12th. But it's a tall order, um, and, and it takes all of us working together on that. Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Susan. Hi, I'm Susan Bro, um, former fourth grade teacher, government secretary for the last eight years. I was really kind of a nobody, full of opinions that nobody really cared to hear until my daughter was killed. And the next morning, the press showed up at my door and I spoke and they went, hmm, and they kept coming back. So I've been given the opportunity to voice my concerns, to voice my opinions, and I'm trying to voice 
concerns and opinions that I feel that everyday Americans have. Um, I'm in a unique position. I am uh, lower middle class income, more on the lower. Um, and I, my grandfather grew up as a sharecropper. Uh, my grandfathers were both coal miners at one time, ran a dairy farm. I come from a lot of the same roots that a lot of the hate groups come from, but I don't share their views. I want to be able to make them understand. I want to be able to make them believe that they are not going to be marginalized by accepting other people. I want them to understand and believe that there is a place for everyone in this country. I grew up believing that phrase on the Statue of Liberty, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. I'm not sure I quoted that right. Um, but you get the gist of it. And um, I believe that Charlottesville can be that. Um, that's why I'm here. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate it. Andrew. Thank you. Uh, well, first, thank you for, for inviting me. And uh, I just met Pierce last week, uh, less than a week ago. And uh, through our conversation, he said, uh, you should come and participate. So um, I'm, I'm honored to be here and, and sitting with, with you all here on this panel. Um, so one of the things that I talk about uh, a lot when I interact with the community is uh, sort of lead off with is um, when I, I know that people in the community, when they see the fire chief or talk about or think about the fire department, in their mind's eye, they're thinking about Chicago fire, right? Mm. And if you're old enough, maybe Towering Inferno or something, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. By the way, the best fire service movie ever made. But, um, and, and what I sort of gently counter with is uh, a, a description of all the things that a fire department does for its community. Um, and certainly the primary... Uh, mission that we still have is to respond, right? So to fires, to emergency medical services incidents, hazardous materials, et cetera. And what we experienced last summer as a, as a department, uh, really as a public safety community, was response um, in a civil unrest, civil disturbance environment in our city, right? So um, a, a series of risks that we're called upon to help manage um, that, that we had never really considered before, and, and I don't think a reasonable person would have asked mm -hmm. us to consider before. Um, so that's sort of the starting point. One of the principles that drives uh, a modern fire department is, is called community risk reduction. Um, and, and quite simply what that means is that if we play a role in response to any type of risk, then we have a duty and an obligation to participate in reducing that risk. So that's why we push smoke alarms. That's why we are advocates for strong fire codes, right? And, and have been very, very successful uh, in those arenas. Uh, but this is new territory for us. And what is our role um, in helping a community grapple with issues that are 400 years old? Um, and we've got our own internal uh, conversations going on within the fire service because we haven't necessarily been uh, you know, led the way um, uh, necessarily across the country in, in being a champion of diversity but, um, and, and inclusion. But the, the, the last thing I would say about, about why, I'm, why I'm here and why I feel it's important to participate in this conversation is everything that we do uh, in the community, all the risks that, that the men and women of our fire department who are on duty today uh, are willing to take, um, it's really a covenantal relationship with the community, uh, is, it's rooted in love and empathy. Right? The willingness to put others before yourself um, in very, very high risk, very, very dangerous situations can only be sustained um, if it comes from a, from a place of love. So that's why I'm here. Mm. That makes sense. Thank you so much, Andrew. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. I am here because the United States of America is a body. It's made up of arms legs, hands, a head. And many years ago, there was a injury to the body. And what was left was a foreign object in that body. And of course, the wound did heal. 
but that foreign object mm -hmm. remained embedded in the body. Mm. And August the 11th and 12th was a trauma, a shock to that area of the body where that foreign object was embedded. And when that occurs, oftentimes, there will be a new injury that occurs. And a operation must take place to eradicate and to remove mm -hmm. that foreign object. So I'm here to be an assistant in seeing that we eradicate that foreign object that remains in the body of the United States. Mm. Outstanding. Oh. Outstanding. Mm -hmm. That's a powerful yeah. metaphor. Thank you. So, Susan, that metaphor reminds me of <laughs> something that we spoke about at the Haven. Last mm. night, yeah. Absolutely. I was trying to think, were you in the room? But you were right. in the room when, when we were talking about this last night. I mean, that night. was aptly stated based on you know, our conversation last night. Thank you. What I want to do is I'm going to ask each of you all a question in your capacities. In your capacity as a community leader, Susan, I want to ask, what's one thing that we've gotten right as far as moving Charlottesville forward to heal? And what's one thing, one specific fix that we need to implement? One thing we've gotten right, I think, is to acknowledge that there are problems, serious problems, not pretend they don't exist. Um, I know at first, I, everywhere I went, I was like, but Charlottesville is such a lovely community, and, it, and it's so peaceful, and these were totally outsiders coming in, causing all kinds of problems. And now I thought about it. And I listened to Mayor Walker, and I listened to a few other people, and I thought, you know, I know that's not exactly true. I lived here when I was poor. I mean, when I was dirt poor, I lived in Charlottesville. And um, I, I know better. So to acknowledge that there are problems is one thing that we have done right. What was the second part of that question? Oh, no worries. What's one specific fix that we need to implement? In well, order to move Charlottesville forward. I think uh, a first fix is let's deal with affordable housing because if you don't have a secure access to decent housing, then nothing else matters. You can't focus on your education, you can't focus on your job, you can't even get a decent job if you don't have affordable housing. Um, I think that's a very big step in the right direction. Parks, statues, and all that are simply symptoms, but bottom line is people got to have a place to live. That makes mm -hmm. sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kathy, I'm going to ask you the same question. What's one thing that we've gotten right from your perspective as a leader on a governmental agency? And what's one specific fix from your uh, role in the community that can be implemented? Um, I think uh, one thing that we have done right uh, since last summer has been to really take uh, the, the call for authentic community engagement and partnership seriously. And that's related to communication. We all realized last summer that we did not communicate well to, the, to our, our citizens, uh, between our departments, between council and uh, the communication breakdown was severe. And that lack of understanding what was going on uh, made everyone more fearful than we already were. Uh, related to that lack of real strong communication strategies, that, that embedded in that is a, is a deep, should be a deep respect and understanding that our community is in partnership with our government. It's not us and them. And so that to me is, is the big challenge that we still have to break down, this idea that somehow government and government departments and government functioning is separate from the people we serve. We are public servants. We must be responsive to those needs expressed to us. And we have a very, very engaged, passionate, well-informed community 
that needs to be uh, integrated with our decision making at all levels. So on the one hand, what we did is we, we, we finally have some really good clear personnel and paths about improving our communication, but we gotta go to a deeper form of partnership through community engagement that brings the public along with us um, in solving problems instead of kind of pushing them away. That makes perfect sense, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. I come to you, Andrew, because you have a unique position in the community. You bridge um, the community and you bridge government entities. You, you sit right at that nexus. So what's, thing, what's one thing that uh, you feel that in your capacity, in your role, um, your folks got right? And what's one fix that you can move forward to implement to move Charlottesville forward? Sure. So w one of the things that, um, that the fire service tends to do really well is uh, connect people to resources. Um, and that's not because we were born with that you know, great quality. It's, it's, uh, it's born out of how we operate on a daily basis. We respond to everything. There's, there's no time when someone calls 911 where we don't go, right? Um, we're coming. Um, and most of what we respond to isn't really that much of an emergency, but we understand to, to that person who called us, it is. Otherwise, they wouldn't have called us, right? Um, and oftentimes, we find ourselves um, uh, dealing with a, a citizen um, who's got a problem that they can't solve that, quite frankly, we don't have the solution to either. But we don't leave until we connect them with someone who can solve that problem. Whether it's the maintenance guy to come fix the elevator or a plumber to come fix the hot water heater, right? And that's a simple version of it, but and all the way up into very complex uh, social, social issues that, that we deal with, you know, uh, law, folks in law enforcement will often talk about being a social worker with a badge, and there's an element of that to a lot of what we do as well in the community. Um, I think we, going back to last summer, I think our ability to operate effectively in what for us, um, and quite frankly, th that combination of, of events had never happened in the United States. Mm. Um, and it's important to understand that when, when you're looking back and making comparisons to other communities and how they've responded mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. what look like similar things, but really weren't. Um, and there's some lessons there uh, that we're trying to share with, with the fire service and with public safety community broadly. Uh, so they understand their risks more effectively. But one of the reasons that, that we were successful where we were in our response and in our, in our planning in our response was because of that natural propensity to reach out and connect. Um, and I think we need to keep going down that road and to operationalize, operationalize that throughout city government. Mm -hmm. um, that should be everybody's response is, this is unfamiliar to me. Who is the expert mm -hmm. that I need to go mm -hmm. to? Um, and it's not about ego, it's not about rank, it's not about department. It's about understanding what the objective is and what the risks are um, and, and, um, and approaching it from that perspective. And that is something that, um, like I said, it's not because we're good, you know, better people, but it's, it's just how we operate uh, culturally. Um, uh, so I, I think we can help serve as a model for how to um, make that happen more broadly in the community. The other thing that I would say that's, that's been a success to, to dovetail on what, uh, what Kathy said as well specifically is, um, is really uh, a, a, a much clearer understanding of, of, of what's happening, uh, of the terrain, right? Of the, what you'd be familiar with, the area of operations, right? Absolutely. The fire officer who arrives at first on the scene of a house fire is required to do what we call a 360 or a hot lap because it makes no sense to try and formulate a strategy and tactics mm -hmm. until you know where the fire is, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think we have a much clearer sense as a community now what the real issues are. Housing, mm -hmm. um, uh, for example. Um, so that's probably not in my wheelhouse to help solve the housing problem, um, but it is, uh, I think, a positive sign that there's a much clearer understanding a much, a, a much a, across a much broader uh, spectrum of the community about what the core issues really are. So we've, we've done our hot lap, 
um, as a community, and uh, now's the time to, to, to put that into action. That's, good. That's a great analogy. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Brother Bernard, look, you are the community surgeon, mm -hmm. all right? Okay. Ah. So now you've scrubbed up, getting ready to get into what you need to do to heal this community. What's one thing that we've gotten right and what's one thing that you're gonna implement moving forward so that we can continue to get it right? I would say prior to August 11th, 12th, there was a lot of talking that was going on. And there's always been a lot of talking, but there wasn't much listening done. So now I feel that there is some listening being done. And when people listen, they become engaged, they can visualize the problem, they can take ownership. We all must take ownership of this problem. It is my belief that we have a long way to go. August 19th, I'm sorry, March, March 19th, 2018, there was an article in the New York Times. It was entitled, Extensive data shows punishing reach for black boys, written in the New York Times about economic achievement. What that article determined was that despite inroads in higher education, there's been a greater creation of a wealth gap. So despite going to Ivy League schools, despite going to the University of Virginia, the University of Chicago, Stanford, UCLA, the wealth gap is widening. We must deal with that. We can only deal with that at an economic platform. So until we open up and reduce barriers to entry for all, will there truly be problems that will remain? and the body of the United States will die because that problem will never be eradicated. So I believe that economic equality, access is the key to eliminating many of our woes in society. So based on that, can I change my answer? <laughs> <laughs> Rather By than all means. providing housing for poor people, let's have less people being poor, not by getting rid of them, by having them move out to Greene County like I did or whatever, uh, but let's get affordable income so that they can pick their own housing. I mean, could I respond to that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, because it, I am a city councilor. I've been, um, this is my second term. Um, it, it, it's always, uh, kind of a human reaction to always say that this is not being done, this is not being done, this is not being done. And I, I do want to just offer you that there have been things done, mm -hmm. and um, particularly with regards to the idea of work and mm -hmm. employment. Um, my first year on council, I made a priority for council ending poverty through employment. Mm -hmm. And because I had seen at that time uh, government orientation towards job and job training was pretty sporadic, it was episodic, it, it, and it was not long-term. So after this work session that we had, and uh, staff, our staff, was multiple departments, was tasked with uh, creating a, 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 a task force to study this issue holistically, they came up with a growing opportunity report. Some of you might also remember this very seminal, important uh, report called the Orange Dot Study that identified that a third of the population of the city of Charlottesville could not live without public assistance um, meet their basic needs. So with that study, with our own staff report, we, and I, I should say, by the way, I was also on this um, employment uh, committee uh, that was a statewide committee where I began to identify patterns that our city residents were not using the one-stop shops that the state had provided for job training our numbers were way low. 
And I communicated that, that's what fed into my wanting that goal of ending poverty through employment. So that growing opportunity report, born out of this work session, gave rise to our downtown job center, which we have three people full time working at helping people get work. Our unemployment rates are very low. Um, and then we also create these growing opportunity programs. We now are very successful in having local people go through that program to get training to be bus drivers. They get their commercial driver's license, which gives them job openings with very good paying jobs. I had been, I'm an architect, by the way, as we've been stated, but I also knew that with all the growth and redevelopment, both in our assisted housing and our public housing that was coming down the pike, all the new roads and bridge repair that we were doing, that we needed to be able to prepare our residents in our city, our low wealth residents, for those jobs. So we've got a growing opportunity skills trades program now. Mm -hmm. We just had a meeting last week with one of our street improvements where the, the team, the engineering and design team, has given us all the, the job trades that we're going to need. Our employment development staff people were there, and we're going to be creating new programs to make sure that when we are ready to, to put shovels into the ground, we're going to have hired our own people hired people that are just coming out of prison, hired people from our low wealth resident, uh, neighborhoods, and they will be trained. So it takes a long time to get the things in place before you even start seeing moving the needle, but that is something that we are ready for. Um, I am a push, I, I, I am a believer in tracking our metrics for progress though, which is something mm -hmm. I must say, our local government does not seem to share because we don't even know what we're fixing if we don't start tracking the data that shows that we're making improvements. So Very true. Um, that same approach, we need, we need, we're going to be getting a, a housing production strategy. We're, going to getting a, we're getting a housing needs assessment done mm -hmm. by next month. That's going to give us targets for specific kinds of affordability that we need to be pushing. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it takes a lot of time, and as I said, as a city, to some friends, a city councilor is like being, uh, trying, to take this medical analogy further, trying to do surgery with mittens on. I am one member of five, I feel like on a chessboard, and we only have one piece to move, and that's our city manager. Mm -hmm. So that city manager takes care of all the other 20 some odd departments. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I am quite removed from the actual execution. In mm -hmm. fact, by law, I'm a legislator. We've legislated up the wazoo. Mm -hmm. It's time to get it into action. Outstanding. Well said. Thank you. I'm coming right. right back to you because in the time we have remaining, um, one of the things that I learned about myself uh, being in uniform was that I absolutely enjoy being a part of something bigger than myself. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us here, mm -hmm. whether we were thrust into it or whether we just grew into it, um, can share that sentiment. When there's a shared mission, a shared vision, then it's easy for us to get on board with that. Now, we've got folks here in the audience, and so in the time we have left, ask them to step up mm. into something bigger than themselves. Make an ask and ask them, what's the one thing you'd like to see? What's the one thing that you'd like to see audience members do as they leave here today? as they think about this throughout the National Week of Conversation, as they're listening to other voices, what's the one thing that they can do? I would like for them to go back to their communities, go back to their jobs, and look around. Look at the people that are in their organizations. Do all of the people look just like them? Hmm. Is there diversity at the CPA firms, at the investment banking firms, at the private offices, the consulting firms? I think what Kathy is doing is commendable on the public sector. Mm -hmm. But this is bigger than the public sector because the public sector mm -hmm. gets money from the private sector through taxes. So we have to look at it from the private sector. How are we going to have inclusion with the public and the private sector coming together to make it more inclusive? 
and providing mm -hmm. opportunity, mm -hmm. economic mm -hmm. opportunities, that allows people to not only get off public housing and other social services benefits, they can do that when they're able to find opportunities to work and get paid a fair salary. So mm -hmm. that would be what I would ask them. Go back, look at your organization. See if everyone in your organization looks like you. What can you do to improve that organization so it won't look like you? I believe that diversity is an asset mm -hmm. and we need to utilize it. Mm -hmm. We need to embrace it. And I give you the last word. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I did Chuck, back. thank you thank for you. moderating. Thank you so much, Come here. <laughs> Councillor Galvin, Susan Bro, Chief Baxter, Bernard Whitsett, thank you all so much. Let's give them another round of applause.